Good day and good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks a lot for organizing this event. Um, we are very excited about it. Thank you, Professor Chude, for, uh, for hosting uh, this event. And thank you for, uh, for giving me a few minutes to, um, to uh, introduce ourselves. I hope that everybody who is not speaking can mute his or her microphone. That saves us a lot of background noise. Okay, uh, my name is Rick van den Bos. I'm the director of the International Soil Reference and Information Center. Um, this uh, this meeting is a uh, this this uh, seminar is a the second seminar in a series of uh, of seminars that we are going to do uh, in the framework of the cooperation agreement between uh, ISRIC and NICE, and uh, we are very happy about that. I would like to share a short anecdote with you to um, to underline why we think this is so important what we are doing together. Um, two years ago, I was in Argentina and we had worked for two years on a very, very nice product for Argentina. Because the other one is... Come Please. Come on. Oh, no. uh, kindly mute your microphone, please. Let me continue. We were in Argentina and we had produced a very nice soil information product and we could, we, we, produce, we um, showed that product to the policy makers in Argentina and they were extremely enthusiastic about the product. They saw the benefit. They saw how nice it was, was made. And then I asked them, are you going to use it? And then they said, no. And I said, why not? I said, because we are working with our own National Soil Information Institute, and they are our partners, and we only use products that they produce. And I thought that made a lot of sense. Um, and for me, that was a sort of an eye-opener. Uh, an eye-opener in the sense that Whatever we produce here at ISRIC, with all the knowledge that we have and the expertise that we have, may not be so relevant at the national institutions and in the, at the national level if those products are not made together with the national partners. So that's why we think it's so important to work with you and to see how we can advance the national soil information in Nigeria. And that's why we are happy with this agreement and also with the meetings. That was my introduction. I'm quickly going to hand over, I think, to Professor Tudor, and not spending more time and asking for more time. Thank you. Professor Tudor. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you, Rick, for that very brief introduction. May, may I refer our colleagues to the, um, the program, the program for today's lecture? You all have it in your system. We're going to follow the program very, very, very closely. Um, uh, according to the program, the, the next speaker is uh, Professor GIC Mwaka. He is going to formally, formally uh, welcome all of us to this meeting. Professor Mwaka, incidentally, is the chairman of the education committee of the council of the Nigeria Institute of Soil Science. Uh, after that, I'll hand over to Professor Raji, who, according to our own understanding, will proceed from there. Professor Waka, I hope you're there. From the Nigerian side, Professor Waka, can you now welcome us to this very important lecture? Yeah, can I? Hello. Yeah, well, I can go on. You can reach. You can can I come in now? Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, the director of East Week, Rivan Del Bosch, the manager external relation, Andres Bosma, community manager, Emily Tona, project coordinator, Mary Sebrick Mosu, and the guest lecturer. 
this week, World Soil Information, Johan Lenardi. The president of the governing council, the registrar, chief executive officer, this, Professor Vio Chude. The president, South Science Society of Nigeria, Professor Bashir Raji. Honorable fellows of the South Science Society of Nigeria, registered soil scientists, Nigeria Institute of Soil Science. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a remarkable, is remarkable in the activities of this, a day the Almighty God has prepared for us to participate in this program titled Compiling a Nigerian Soil Profile Database for Agricultural Development. This program is jointly organized by NIS and ISRIC, World Soil Information. On behalf of the President, Governing Council, NIS, and the Registrar, Chief Executive Officer, NIS, May I welcome all of you to this enlightening and educative lecture program. Today's outing is part of the fulfillment of the mandatory continuous professional education with the aim of sharpening the skills of members and regulated professional soil scientists registered with the Institute. Please, Pay absolute attention. I'm sure that all registered members of this must have gotten the instruction on how to log in. The information you are about to be furnished with is vital and full of knowledge on how to manage the soils. Surely, good and appropriate soil management leads to a high and sustainable agricultural productivity enhancing and ensuring food security and uh, availability and also environmental care. Thank you and be blessed as you're listening. You are welcome. Thank you, Professor Raji. You want to introduce the president of NIS and then you, you take it over from there. You're welcome, Professor Raji, please. Welcome to our first day. Very important thing. I only please follow the instructions. Let's mute our mics and enjoy this lecture. What I really like this is it has to do with compilation of soil testing. Let's give uh, the speaker all the maximum cooperation so that we can get the maximum benefit from today's lecture. Thank you very much. Looking forward to a successful lecture. So the president of the yeah, the, the, the president of NIS can now give us his opening remarks and uh, we'll, we'll, like Roger said, we'll proceed from there. Professor Ayogokule, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Registrar. I am tempted to stand on the existing protocol but I will do a quasi program by welcoming the guest lecturer of today, Dr. Johan Linas of ISRIC, the president of the Soil Science Society of Nigeria, the registrar of the Institute NIS. I want to welcome also members of the Council of NIS, our zona coordinators, the heads of NIS working groups, and fellow registered soil scientists. This is the first 
MCPE program and the very first official outing of NIS and NIS Council in the second term that has just been given to us. Looking at the title of today's lecture, I'm very well pleased that we are starting on starting our second term on the right and most appropriate note. By our training as agriculturists, we know very well that the starting point and even throughout the lifespan of a farming project is a proper understanding of the kinds and characteristics of the soils on the landscape of interest. Otherwise, the project has failed from the start and cannot achieve much success later on. NIS, as an institute established for the regulation of the use of and management of soil resources in Nigeria, cannot fulfill its mandate unless its members are grounded in this foundational knowledge. This is why the appropriateness of this topic of today's lecture cannot be overemphasized. Let me repeat for emphasis that the mandatory continuous professional education, MCPE program, was approved by this governing council for all registered soil scientists to facilitate and enhance our continuous and professional development in compliance with international standards. The program is also meant to promote and sustain professional competence for excellent performance of registered soil scientists. Hence, participation is an important part of the requirements of, for renewal of the professional license from one year to another. We have had a total of six lectures thus far. The first set of five lectures was held on November 3, 2020. And the second one was on November 17, also by ISTRIC. And today is the seventh lecture. It is titled Compiling a Nigerian Soil Profile Database for Agricultural Development. Obviously, we, that is NIS, the Soil Science Society of Nigeria, and the entire federal government of Nigeria, we are greatly indebted to ISRIC for the center's contributions towards sustainable soil use and management and its consequence, that is food security in Nigeria. I am convinced that every participant is fully ready to receive this invaluable information for practical application so that the purpose of the lecture may be realized. I wish all of us a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Great. So, who is the guest lecturer? Where does it come from? What are his antecedents? What are 
we we have we met him before other than the international community or uh, probably here in nigeria professor raji please president of sssn you may want to give us the bio of the speaker for today this our special guest speaker thank you professor raji distinguished Colleagues, Chairman Nis Kansu, the Vice President and Member of Councils here present, distinguished participants, today we are privileged to have Johan Linas, a senior soil scientist who is going to address us today on a very, very important topic for us. But let me quickly go through just a peek of some of his background so that we can all appreciate how lucky we are to have him today. Johan joined Eastwick in 2009 as the soil legacy data officer for the african soil information service office and over soil map projects he compiled the african soil profiles database in collaboration with african partners he conceptualized much of the world soil information system and contributed immensely to the African soil grids by producing the root depth soil water maps beside co-producing soil nutrient maps. Later, Johan has been leading WRB Soil Resource Survey and mapping campaigns in Ethiopia. Most of his current work at history is focused on developing agronomic sound approaches to coherently model, map, and test crop and site specific soil fertility and crop nutrient management recommendations across very environment. Johan graduated from Hennigan University in 1990 with a specialization in soil survey and land evaluation. Since then, he has been involved in various projects for public and private organizations, as well as freelance in Burkina Faso. He has been involved in Senegal, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Niger, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Iran, Jordan. The list is endless. The list is endless. The emphasis of his work throughout these years has been and is oriented towards sustainable and profitable risk averse soil fertility management for which he conducted numerous fertilizer trials both on farm and on station and land use system analysis at various scales and in arid and in arid to humid conditions, applying the functionalities of crop growth stimulation modeling and GIS, and his agro pedagogical knowledge. His drive is to contribute to sustainable intensification of smallholder agriculture in Africa. Johan speaks fluently Dutch, English, and French. 
And very soon, I know he will be speaking one of the Nigerian. Um, may, may I then formally invite the guest speaker for today, Juan, to please take the floor and do justice to the topic for today's lecture. Thank you, Juan. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chude. Um, I'm very happy to. Uh, to, to give this lecture today. I will uh, start sharing my screen. I hope you all can hear me well. Um, but before before starting, I first would like to, to thank, um, thank you for the opportunity to give this lecture. Uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, Professor, also for the kind words of uh, Professor Nwaka, Professor Obun Kunle, and Professor Chude, as well as Professor Raji. But also I thank you, I'll th I'd like to thank all the participants which have been um, coming here in, in large quantities and actually the whole soil science community of Nigeria. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity and I will now start sharing the screen. Thank you. Mm. Second. Can you can you see this? Not yet. Not yet. I have to go back. I think. Sorry. Yeah. And now you can, huh? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so this is the program. Um, we'll continue. Um, it's uh, this lecture will be about compiling a Niger Nigerian soil profile database and uh, for agricultural development. OK, let's improvise. <laughs> so this is the this is the thank you very much for uh, this uh, solution. Um, there are quite many slides, so I have to say very often. Uh, next slide, please, but maybe. Maybe you just yeah, go page to page. So this is a, a soil property map that uh, the soil grids that we produce um, uh, using uh, soil profile data. This is really based on legacy soil profile data. So this is for the whole of the world. Um, next slide. And and this is then indeed the this is indeed a compilation of. Uh, soil profile data for the world, um, but we like to focus on, on Africa now as an example also because I mean Nigeria is in Africa, so we zoom, we will start zooming in. So please next slide. And um, and this is then, let's say, how we started compiling the Africa soil profile database. Wow. Um, so please just uh, just just uh, go slowly to the next slides uh, and I, I will talk through it. So just go. Not too slow, yeah, like this. Okay, very good. Uh, this is the baseline. Um, we added more uh, ISRIC data sets, well, digital data set easily available. Please continue. And um, and here we had the luck to find a big digital data sets from Malawi, which then suddenly very much increased already the density in that part of Africa. That's one. Yes, please. Next slide, please. And then already, and then indeed, at a certain moment, we focused on, on, on Nigeria together with uh, Nigerian partners. Um, as you can see, we have Ode, they're also Amapu, and we, uh, we were working together to collect and find uh, legacy data in the country, but also in our libraries. And then we added a lot of data from, uh, from uh, analog reports to, to produce actually the first version of uh, Nigerian soil profile database and being part of the Africa soil profile database. Please, next one. So this uh, results in the first version of the Africa soil profile database, version 
Please, next uh, slide. And this was already used by various uh, uh, so various scientists. This one is to, to validate uh, Peter transfer functions to predict uh, soil moisture content uh, using the uh, this version of the database. Uh, please, next uh, uh, slide. It was also used by Ode to, to do uh, digital soil mapping, as you can see. So he focused really on Nigeria and produced uh, digital soil maps of the soil pH and also the uh, soil organic carbon content at different depths, um, which is already a very nice result of uh, of uh, of this uh, of this work at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, it was also used by other uh, colleagues like Ubaje, who, who produced maps of the available water capacity of Nigeria. And next, for, next slide. And then also ACPA has been uh, working uh, a lot on, um, together with Australians, uh, on uh, producing soil maps for, uh, for example, soil texture and also, next slide, soil organic carbon. And these are really like first versions of, uh, uh, of um, of results from from working on compiling legacy soil profile data for Nigeria and actually yeah, the whole of, of Africa, and this of course can be improved with more data and more data will imply better maps, more accurate maps, and maybe higher resolution maps. Please next slide. Uh, next slide. So okay, we continued compiling. Then we, we arrived at version 1.2. Uh, it also has a report, so all details are described in this report. And this uh, this data set has like 18,500 uh, soil profile point locations uh, with standardized and uh, standardized uh, soil data. Next slide, please. Uh, the accuracy of uh, uh, of the of the data, yeah, legacy data, is quite variable, but on the majority of the data had an accuracy of. Uh, 0.00225 decimal degrees, which actually is approximately not 200 to 150 meter accuracy. So it's not very accurate, um, but it's uh, it's less accurate than than these days with GPS. But okay, this is this is um, what it was. Next slide, please. Also, age is variable, so we have data going all the way down to let's say 50, 60 years old. But also, I mean, quite recent data from, uh, let's say, only five years old, with uh, the majority is, is, uh, is data from approximately 30 years old. Next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, the average depth of observations, uh, let's say the data is uh, 125 centimeter, and the uh, average uh, amount of uh, soil horizons that have been sampled for which we have data is four, and it's 4.1 on average. So uh, it's really soil profile data. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, the data from this, let's say, uh, data compilation is uh, the density is, is quite spe uh, property specific. It's also country specific. As you can see, we, we were able to uh, compile more data from one country than maybe another country for different reasons. Uh, but also um, uh, certain soil properties are more common than other properties, like, for example, clay or pH or uh, organic carbon. The data is quite common, but if you go, for example, to data for bulk density or uh, 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 electric conductivity, for example, and there you can see that the density is much lower because the data are more rare. Please, next slide. Okay, this is, I mean, there's a whole list, but I mean, the conclusion is that the, that the nature and the quality of the data, legacy data, varies. Yeah, so, I mean, it can be good, it can be uh, less good, but it's, it's variable. That's a very important character of legacy data. Please, next slide. So, this is, I mean, this was all within the OFSIS project. Same project, there were also data collected uh, at Sentinel sites. And actually, these data, um, are more constant in nature and also in the quality. Not necessarily better quality, but I mean a constant quality, which is a quality by itself, of course. But you can also see that the dent that the quantity is much lower, and also actually the the depth of observation is also uh, much shallower. So it's actually only topsoils and what they call subsoils, but let's say up till 50 centimeter. Uh, so it's a trade-off between the two things. So please, next slide. 
And here we can see that uh, uh, we combined the two, uh, all the assets data. So we get legacy data together with um, uh, the Sentinel side data. And you can see they both have a very different distribution. And I think they do add value to each other. Uh, please, next slide. And this is maybe an important thing. On the, on the X axis, you can see that's the cost of collecting and compiling the data. And, and at the, on the left hand side, it's let's say the, uh, the amount of uh, profiles that you could have. And, and then the legacy data are, I mean, compiling legacy data is very much more cost efficient than, uh, let's say, collecting uh, new soil data. It doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, new soil data are very good. Uh, but I mean, there is also much to win uh, if you have, if the budget is, let's say, limited at a certain moment to compile legacy data at a relatively low cost and produce maps and, and, and interpretations at a certain res uh, accuracy. And if indeed that can become an argument to update and collect additional new data, but at a higher cost. So, I mean, this is, of course, a very important consideration. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, to com so the Nigerian soil profile database for agricultural development. Uh, my statement is that the, the Africa soil profile database may be a good starting point to compile the Nigerian soil profile database for agricultural development. Um, and I would like to mention also that an updated version of the Africa soil profile database is, at, is actually at the basis of the Global Soil Information System, GLOSIS, which is currently in development for the Global Soil Partnership. So uh, a lot of the procedures that we developed by then are being now, let's say, uh, taken over and, and, and formalized and, I mean, improved, of course. Um, but the base is still, to a large extent, this Africa Soil Profile database. So that's also why I stick to this, uh, to this uh, example, also because I know it better. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And therefore, I, I would propose what we also did actually in a few other countries, for example, Ghana, to use like a two stage approach. Uh, first, compile legacy soil profile data and use that for mapping at, at more a coarse scale. And then sometimes maybe of stable soil properties over the full soil profile depth. And it can be texture, that can be um, uh, cation exchange capacity. Uh, it could be uh, yeah, uh, soil depth itself, but maybe also pH. Uh, certain properties. That, I mean, you can you you can discuss what is really uh, stable and not stable. But okay, it could be a first version, and then at stage two for a specific area of interest, uh, if you have let's say the funds to collect and add additional new soil, soil data, soil profile data, and then use this additional data to update the map for that area at a finer scale and higher accuracy and possibly using more dynamic soil properties, which are often only collected from the top soil. So it's a trade-off, eh? combining two types of data. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, uh, anyway, for compiling the data, yeah, let's say the Nigeria soil profile database, uh, I give here an overview. So for uh, a few steps, first, of course, you inventorize uh, uh, the soil data sources that you uh, can find. Uh, make a catalog of what are the, uh, let's say, the reports, uh, the, 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 the papers, the, the manuscripts, et cetera, maybe data sets uh, available. Now, these data sources you try to collect to really put your hands on it. And maybe you can also make a scan to make a digital version of your paper report. Then try to evaluate these data sources and identify those which are really suitable to compile. And if you want to use it for digital soil mapping, then they should have coordinates, or at least you should be able to give coordinates, geographic coordinates to the soil profile data. So that is a, a criterion. Um, if, uh, if your data are analog eh, on paper, you, you want to uh, digitize it eh, by, um, uh, by data entry. So you, you put your data into tables for profile one, profile two, profile three, and then soil property one, two, three, et cetera. Um, and then also, once you do this, also add the necessary metadata to the soil data sets. I mean, this is absolutely key. We have different properties, but you have to describe them because others, otherwise other people will not know what it means, eh? what, what type of data you have been putting in your, in your data set. 
is it in percentage or is it in gram per kilogram, etc. Okay, if you have your data digital, try to import the soil data sets into a standard database model. So you have one database model, which is with a certain setup, which is your standard, that's your target, that's where you put your data into for your compiling. And then once the data are in that model, you try to compile the data itself from original conventions to standard conventions. Uh, as an example, I could say, for example, uh, if I have data sets I, uh, from, from French, Francophone Africa, and they say argile. And in my data set, I, we use English and we say clay. I mean, it's a very simple example. Uh, I mean, you have to convert argile to clay and maybe percentage to indeed percentage uh, and these kind of things. Um, Okay, then we come to the step of harmonizing data. I will explain it later. Quality control, of course, eh, is very important. And then once you have all your data together, make your database what they call fair, eh, which is findable to others, accessible to others, interoperable, and eh, that means uh, you can, uh, and, and reusable, which includes putting a license to your database so that other people know if they can or cannot use it. And then continue with the next version. Right? Just continue adding data. Please, next slide. Okay, here I will try to uh, what we call uh, some basic principles of compiling uh, SOAP profile data, uh, as we call it actually. Uh, so we normally always start, okay, for, uh, do, do very carefully write down the lineage of your data, uh, give the identifier. And write down the author, the year, the report, title, etc. What is your data set? For example, what's your, your survey report? It's very important to, to, keep, to keep track of your data so you don't compile the same data store. Please mute your microphone if you're not speaking, please. Apart from the speaker, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you don't compile your data set twice. You first look really what have we already done and can I then find additional data set. But it's also important if you have your data and at a certain moment maybe there is a problem with the data or you don't trust or there's an error, you can always also trace back to the, to the data source and read again uh, maybe some certain specifications uh, and to check if, if, if everything is correct. Okay, then of course we continue with the soil data itself. Please, next slide. And the soil data are preferably organized as what we call observations and measurements. That is a terminology on, on, on geoscience ML. But they say, I mean, everything is an observation or a measurement uh, data. And if you make uh, a data entry, I mean, you always should specify the feature, the attribute, the method, and the value. So let's repeat, so the feature is actually what are we talking about? Which piece of the earth, which, which object are we talking about? So we talk about the soil and the soil does have uh, 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 geographic coordinates, X and Y. It also has a depth, so a depth interval is the Z and it has a time, yeah? so timestamp is a T. So if you define this, then we really know, okay, this is this piece of soil at this time, uh, in, in, at this moment in time, and that's an observation. Then we know what we are talking about. But then also we say, OK, what attribute, what soil property are we talking about? So that should be, of course, well defined. It's, it's trivial, but it's, uh, it should be included in the data set and, and well described. Next one is uh, the method. Uh, what is the method or the procedure of, um, uh, sorry, the method of or the procedure of uh, of uh, uh, measuring or observing this attribute uh, that can and most of the time these then we re, do we refer to laboratory procedures. Uh, will you be measuring available phosphorus with with Olsen? Or will you use Bray or will you use Truorg or or Malik or something else? Uh, that's important to note because then later you know which data can you and can you not combine together uh, and query it. And at the end, of course, the value. Eh? What value have you measured? Please, next slide. So the value is then um, does include the unit of expression. Eh? For example, is it in, in centimeter or inches 
or is it in, 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 in milligram per kilogram or gram per kilogram or gram per hundred gram or in a, a weight percentage or volume percentage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is very important, of course. Yeah, the difference can make sometimes a difference of tenfold. Yeah? If you have a number of, let's say, 10, yeah? is that 10? Oh, it's 10 organic carbon. Is that 10%? Oh, that's quite high. Or it's, oh, it's gram per kilogram. It's only one, 10 gram per kilogram is actually one yeah, percent. So uh, uh, it's very important. And also we have, of course, uh, descriptive data, which are for which we have very often dictionaries yeah, or lookup tables uh, uh, for which we, um, like uh, position on the slope or a uh, paramaterial or maybe also morphological observations, uh, etc. cetera, of drainage. Yeah, so then we say, is it poorly trained? Is it moderately well-trained, well-trained, et cetera. Okay, then, so, so this is also how the database should be built up. I mean, you should be able to specify these things. And then of course, uh, the metadata on these uh, definitions of uh, observation and measurements, what are really our standards? Uh, what, is, what is the original one and what is the standard one? The original one can change all the time uh, uh, because you have a new data source and you try to convert it to your standard uh, your target database, your database, and then, I mean, really have well-defined uh, what, for example, uh, what attributes and what methods and what uh, units, et cetera, are you using to uh, define your data. And then we continue. So we compile data. So we very often, we start with original data and all these original data sets, they have all a different setup and they use different abbreviations and maybe different methods, et cetera. And these indeed, we try to, to standardize them to, uh, to target conventions. And we, before we have been using this, uh, the, uh, the data standards of the SOTOR database and a more recent version, uh, which is not published, but is based on the AVO guidelines for soil description and also uh, uh, certain uh, laboratory standards. Uh, and that's how we convert these, uh, uh, that's the standard we convert to. And that's at a certain moment, we talk about harmonized data and the difference between standardization and harmonization is that standardization is that you organize your data. It's really like that your data are all organized in, in the same database model with all, let's say, the same names and the same units and et cetera, so that you can query the data and that you can really combine them together. But harmonization is, is a next step of complexity and often not easy to do because it's uh, it converts your value to a property, to a value, as if all the properties, uh, if all the data have been measured with one laboratory method. For example, you could convert your organic carbon data, which have been measured with, by Walkie and Black uh, and method. You could convert them as if they have been measured by dry combustion. And if you say, okay, that's our, our target, and we really like to have all our data as harmonized as possible, then you would make these conversions. The problem, of course, is that it is not always possible because you need to know uh, the rules, the conversion factors to go from, let's say, one method to another method. And these data are not always available. So that's also why I put it between brackets. Next slide, please. A little bit down. So um, the, then we have also the data, the quality control. And of course, we, I mean, the original data, you always have already like a basic quality control. You can already often, see, especially if you're a little bit experienced, you can see quite quickly already that certain data are, uh, cannot be true. Uh, they, 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 they are incorrect and are errors. Uh, maybe uh, a pH of 20 or uh, I don't know, uh, your, your sand, silt, and clay fractions, they add up to uh, 250, which should be 100. And these, let's say, simple rules. Um, but at a certain moment, if you have compiled your data and you have um, maybe taken out some obvious errors, you have, you have them standardized, then you can also do queries and you can make a query like all data, uh, all pH data between, uh, which is higher than this or lower than that, uh, uh, we consider it an error or at least something to give attention to. Maybe go back to the original data source and verify if you did it correctly. Uh, this becomes more complex if you have, for example, uh, double uh, properties like a CN ratio. 
uh, if the CN ratio is, is, let's say, very high, have far beyond uh, what is normal, then you have to really estimate, like, is that because your carbon is too high or your nitrogen is too low? Uh, so if you don't know, I mean, then the data, I mean, should should go out. But if, I mean, if you can really uh, solve this problem, I mean, you could change it. But of course, you, you like to keep it traceable, so you can always go back if you do it incorrectly. And it's only with harmonized data that you can do a really full data control, full full quality control. Uh, that means, uh, for example, if you have a high base saturation and a very low, uh, of let's say high acidity, yeah, low pH, now these two things, they do not always go together uh, theoretically. And then you can look at these uh, kinds of um, uh, in pattern uh, consistencies. But that's already quite complex. And then at the end, of course, eh, make your data fair, give the license. Um, so these would be the basic principles of, of compiling a so profile data set. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay. Um, how to do that? Uh, uh, I remember like when we when we started this work also in the beginning, we had first we spent like one or two years discussing and arguing and working on all kinds of templates and databases, etc. And nobody agreed. Uh, and because there are many different type of databases and different templates, all with their advantages and disadvantages. And at a certain moment, I thought, uh, I don't care. Let any template will do. Uh, just do it, right? Um, so we started with an empty uh, table. We say, okay, profile number one, attribute number one, value number one. Next. Uh, and, and then indeed you organize your data. Ah, yeah, this is now a very complex picture. <laughs> I'm sorry, because normally in the in the in the in the PowerPoint presentation, they these things they would come one by one by one, but now it's in the PDF, it all comes uh, in one picture. But here, I, I mean, this is how we uh, started working. Like, okay, first, uh, start with your first profile record. You start with a lineage, as you can see. Uh, um, was from a data set, wise, uh, we specify it. Also in that data set, there is a report. Uh, that is then, is, this is then a report in our library, a le report identifier 13514. Okay, so that's where the data come from. Then in the next table, is our first profile. Uh, we call it profile identifier oh yeah, one. It's a simplification. That is it's just an example. And this profile has X, y, X, y Z, and T. Yeah? So it's defined in, in uh, it's defined in space and time. It has coordinates, uh, is different, there's a different depth, uh, and also a time, 1979. And this profile has four different horizons or four different uh, depth intervals, layers, so to say. Uh, and then we have uh, profile one, layer ID one, two, three, and four, with some data attached to it. And uh, the color, uh, laboratory data, uh, from the clay, pH, organic carbon from the lab. And then all the way down, we, we specify the method. So you see in the, in the profile inventory table, we have a key method, it's a key that we have on the, on the right hand side, and then we have this large arrow to the left uh, down, which then points to the same key of the method, and there in that table, the different methods for the different uh, laboratory uh, procedures have been specified. So you, once you have this database, you can query it, and you can say, I only want to have uh, uh, data on, uh, on, um, uh, on, P, on, let's say, pH with and calcium chloride, uh, you can query this. As you can see, I mean, there is a dictionary describing the meaning. So we have a PC04, as you can see, all the way down uh, to measure pH. And PC04 means pH in a one to two soil. Uh, yeah, calcium chloride solution. So that's the method. So that's how we try to build up the database. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, next. Next again, yeah, okay. Um, and then, okay, after the first profile, uh, with the same template, just continue. We do this then the first five profiles as an example. Uh, so this, the, the middle table is really the backbone of the database. So there is really the profiles inventory. 
So we have profile number one up till five. Eh? From there, I could continue. And then with these arrows that I just showed, you link to your lineage, your data sources, eh? data sets and data reports, but also to your data, your layer data, as well as to your methods and, and, and your uh, meta descriptions. But also, actually, there is not a table that I added which describes the attributes themselves and also describes the units. Let's say it's wrong. Next, please. Okay, so then, um, then I give some examples of this so-called uh, basic principles. So the first would be really to to make a lineage, uh, to make yeah, to make an inventory and to specify your lineage in your data set. Um, and you can look up okay, what did you already compile, and then also, uh, uh, and then um, and then look at looking for additional data sets to see if there are suitable data. And this is for example from our library, so you can already see. Yeah, I made a query of Nigeria and soil, and then these are, let's say, the, uh, the data reports and some maps as well, which are scanned and digitally available, and you can just click on it and look into it and see if there are data. But of course, you could first look at the Africa Soil Profile database to see the inventory of data sources that have been used already. So, I mean, I would not do it again. I would try to find additional reports. Next slide, please. Um, oh, these, these two have been switched, sorry. So, I mean, talking about uh, the SOPROFILE database, so there are 540 data sources. 20 of them were digital. There were, these were already databases, data sets yeah, of different, uh, different uh, data models. Which we, but that was relatively quick. And then, of course, we had like over 500 analog reports. Uh, from which we have been entering data, which is relatively very slow because it's it's a bit of, as we say, um, it is it is it is more slow. But of course, I mean, it, but it's still relatively uh, it doesn't cost much. I mean, of course, it is not free. You have to do something, uh, but it's of course less expensive than going to the field. Um, so data entry, import them into the database, and sell uh, the data. Please, next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of uh, also data source that we compiled for the SOAP profile data for, from Ghana. Uh, so, I mean, we can all specify them in a, in a data set. Next, please. Um, I mean, then we give an example, for example, uh, here we would have something, a data set in the top. It's, a, I think, let me see, it's a, uh, I think it's a map. Uh, no, it, on top is a report, it's a SOAP profile report, and on the back, down, it's a, it's a corresponding soil map. Please, next uh, slide. And this is then the example, like indeed, so uh, one identifier is a re the map, and the other one is, is the report. Next slide, please. So this is one of your neighbors, right? Okay. Um, and then you can see in the report, we see uh, uh, yeah, actual soil profile data, as you can see here. So this is in French. You can see the depth intervals. We have a profile identifier, and you have your properties. And then somewhere in the report, also the methods have been defined. Next slide, please. As you can see, this actually uh, is not a soil profile, but actually it's more a soil mapping unit, right? So the conclusion here is uh, that we would not find any coordinates for these soil profiles. Yeah, this is quite an old, quite old report. Uh, and we could we could not find the, the location of the soil profile and, and, and georeference. So actually, we did not include this data in, into our soil profile database. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another one. So this is from Tanzania. We have uh, site data. We have a morphological description on the left-hand side, uh, lower side. And then, of course, we have analytical data for a profile. Uh, often, if it is scanned, I mean, sometimes you can just select the data from the report and then copy paste them into into a table and then reorganize it a little bit, and you have your data. Be careful because the copying is sometimes uh, uh, creates additional creates errors, so you have to check it. Uh, but also, you can see that the, that the profile does have coordinates. Huh? You see it in the circle, so there's a profile point location with. Uh, uh, with coordinates specified in degrees, minutes, and seconds, uh, uh, going uh, south and east. So this is a, so this is then a suitable profile to, to compile into the into the data set. Next profile, please. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an example from, uh, oh, too quick, one, one up. Uh, so this is uh, an example from, uh, from Nigeria. I think, what's the name again? This la land systems uh, survey, I think. Um, and there, the profiles, they have a, a location on the map. So they did not have, let's say, coordinates specified, but they did have maps on which the, the profiles are specified. So indeed, if you then georeference this map and you point your, your, uh, your locations on your, on, your, on your topographic map, you can reasonably accurately uh, uh, assess the, the, the location of the, of the soil profile observation. Next slide, please. Uh, and then there's an example from uh, also from Nigeria. Uh, yeah, exactly how how we how we have been doing that. So we have been georeferencing these maps. We have been uh, um, indicating the point locations from these maps, and that's the way uh, how we georeference quite a lot of the soil profile data that we that we compiled for uh, Nigeria. Next slide, please. Then there is a, a next one, which is uh, the most time-consuming approach and also the least accurate uh, so these are it's also this is i think um uh, how do you call again uh okoye no uh the old 650,000 uh, map of nigeria i think from the 90s or so uh, so there are many of the profiles they did not have like locations neither a map but they did have descriptions of the location so let's say north of uh, of uh, well, let's say let's say uh, so many kilometers south uh, northeast of of Jos. Uh, so that's we have also been georeferencing soil profile locations this way. It is a very slow and also inaccurate way of of uh, georeferencing soil profiles. Okay, these are three ways. Please next uh, approach of oh, next slide. Okay, so then we arrive at a certain moment at the, at the, at the, at some part uh, of data that we have our standardized uh, data. So these are standardized uh, profile site uh, values data. So on the left hand side, we have our profile identifiers. They have a coordinate in decimal degrees. Um, uh, some site data, which are all according to, uh, to the dictionary, to the standard dictionaries that we use. So uh, landform is uh, LP means that it's a level land, uh, it's, a, it's a plane for example, or your parameter or your land cover, so all these codes, and then also these codes are then somewhere described in uh, a specific, in a, in a dictionary. So for the parametrial, uh, we see, um, uh, we see somewhere VB, yeah, when we look up VB, oh, no, no, I think that's it. Next uh, slide, please. Here, here we see the same profiles. Actually, original. So we have we really translate the name. Here is fine. We have we have translated the, the the attribute names from the original data set to our own names. Uh, hi, Johan. I think you're freezing again. Okay? Hmm. Johan, I'm you're muted. muted. Oh, okay. I'm not hearing anything again, no. You're muted, Johan. Yeah. I've been talking for half an hour already. No, we could hear you till the last uh, minute or so. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's I didn't okay. know I was muted. Yeah, okay. Um, I didn't know where it stopped, but I mean, okay. If you, so here we, here, this is so. These are let's say profile side data, as you can see uh, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and also Cameroon. 
Uh, we have coordinates in UTM, we have coordinates in degrees, minutes, seconds. We have all these side data in, in text, in French and, and English. And if we go, let's say, back one slide, you can see how we have standardized all these data uh, into all into the same decimal degrees and, and, and data according to dictionaries. OK, next slide, please. Now, here we have some, let's say, layer data. Yeah, they are standardized and quality controlled. Uh, we have some uh, data from um, the same profiles again, the Congo, Cameroon, and, and Malawi. We have some data for uh, some, some uh, morphological data. But then most of the data we focus actually on the laboratory data. So here they are all uh, quality controlled. So organic carbon is in gram per kilogram and not gram per hundred gram, etc. So that's how we convert them. Please, next slide. And now yeah, this is not fully a very good example. There's some shift, but these were the original layer data, layer values. And actually, we uh, we only kept the original data if they if if that if we converted them to to a standard. If if the data were just correct, and just there was nothing wrong, then we didn't keep them. But only if we say okay, we had to do something with it, then we kept the, the original data. So you can see uh, some complicated uh, morphological data, and then also uh, data on. Um, you can see the, the sum of uh, sand, silt, and clay, which then yeah, 105 degrees, which we standardized to 100 no, percent. Um, um, yeah. So these are the original data. Please, next slide. So we try to keep both the original data and the standardized data. So the standardized data is, of course, our target, but we always like to go back to the original one, and if needed, indeed, to the original report. OK, here I try to explain so how we did standardize the, uh, the metadata. Uh, here you can see this description of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the soil attributes. So they are in a certain table. They have a certain code. Yeah? So I mean, we have C sand means coarse sand. And we have coarse fragments from the lab. Uh, we have pH water, pH KCL, etc. Mm -hmm. We have the unit specified uh, description of the attribute. And then for certain, these are for certain layers, for certain profiles, uh, uh, also the, the method specified. Um, please, next slide. So this will be the target. And this is then actually the, the original data set. This is what we recently did uh, together with Rwanda. So this is uh, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture of uh, Rwanda. So they had the original data, these are, they are in French indeed. So there they have different uh, now they have their table names uh, and then also uh, attributes with a, with a certain code, different codes. So we try to translate them to our target code. We have different units, we try to translate them to our target units. We have the methods of, of, the, of the laboratory also in the street to our target uh, and a description. Now, please, next slide. And then indeed, what's this? What we call the mapping of the of the of the metadata. So you can see we go from on the left hand side from our original definitions, uh, our original attributes from this data set and the Minagri data set, uh, and we we map them, we convert them to uh, to our to our standard definition. So we we look for the original ones, we look for the first one, we see STG. And then we look, okay, what, uh, what, what does it mean? It is described and we understand it. And then we look and we say, oh, this is what we call coarse fragments. Of course, sand, like, sorry, coarse sand. Uh, then also you see refus. And then we look for it and we say, okay, this is what we call coarse fragments from the lab, etc. I mean, this, this part, uh, you, can, you can automate this whole compilation going from digital data sets to, uh, to read them into a template. Uh, uh, convert them, etc., and then standardize them to the, our start. But there's always one step that cannot be um, done uh, by by automation. It, it requires a manual interpretation of an expert, uh, where you really try to where you interpret what is being meant in your data source, and how do I translate it to our standard definition. So this is actually this is the key step to. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now this is the result of the database. It's query, so all kinds of uh, different tables. Actually, it's just pro. It's lineage. It's the profiles. It's the layers. 
uh, right, which has all the values, and then we have a lot of dictionaries also to uh, uh, to, to define what laboratory, what method, uh, etc. Next slide, please. And this then we, we have combined it to a data model. Looks very complicated, but it's not that complicated. So we have on the left upper side, um, we have uh, the coordinates of the profiles. Uh, you can see it, it's a, it's a, it's a shape file. And that one just links to this long table, which is uh, the profile inventory. So first I have in this one, all kinds of data sources uh, in which we indicate the, the names, the original names of the profile. And at the end, we, we define one uh, profile identifier. But then we start moving to all kinds of metadata also. I mean, what is the key to the methods descriptions, to the unit descriptions, and to the attribute descriptions, so to these tables, so you can query it. Uh, there's something on the on, on the source database and the source reports, and um, et cetera. This looks more complicated than it is. <laughs> but you can then, once you have combined all this, you can then query, uh, you make, make queries through the, uh, the identifiers within the data set. Please, next slide. Uh, do you want to get to the end, uh, Johan, or do you still want to take questions at some point? Yeah, but yes. But that, what you not... find convenient. Yes, thank you very much, Mary. Um, so, this, okay, this is an example of the querying. So I have combined all these data, let's say data and data tables with identifiers and keys so that the tables do link. So I just entered the data in an Excel sheet. It's very simple. We imported them in, in, in a GIS environment like here. And here, as we say, make a query, uh, all data from Nigeria. So they are blue here. So, yeah, so these are the data from Nigeria, as, as you can see. Um, and specified here in, in maybe the third column is you no know, in the in the first column we can see the name of of, of a data set source report identifier it's seven eight nine seven okay next slide please now this then another table and in this table we have all the inventory of all the data sources and actually these are the data sources that we use to compile the Nigerian data. And oh, 07, oh, this one, the example is not in this table, sorry, but I mean, uh, but it starts indeed this, the, the, met the survey of Okoye, what I already said, at the Reconnaissance Soil Survey of Nigeria, 650,000 scales. So most of the profiles are from this survey. It's quite a lot of work to digitize all that. Next slide, please. And then, uh, and there are also a few source databases. So that's the ISIS database. The WASP database and the WISE database. Next one, please. Now here we have, let's say, the layer, uh, the the layer data uh, compiled from these data sources. So, uh, so we have the profile identifier, the layer identifier. We have the depth intervals, how many centimeters, and indeed uh, 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 pH, uh, electric conductivity, exchangeable bases, uh, uh, organic carbon, uh, total nitrogen. Uh, available phosphorus, etc. So you see all these data, and when there is no data, I put 9999 minus 999. Next slide, please. So now we can make a query. So here we made a query. Okay, so these are the soils are from Nigeria, and only give me those uh, soil profiles where with the, where the cation exchange capacity is more than 24 centimol charge per kilogram soil or milli equivalent per hundred gram soil. So then uh, this is now how you can make your queries. So where uh, uh, these could be the maybe the blue source or liquid source. Um no, uh island source and yeah, please. Uh, next slide. Now here we have then uh, what are the attributes? So we have indeed we have queried uh, the, the profiles with the cation exchange capacity above 24 centimol. Um and here then we, we see, okay, but what are the laboratory methods used to measure the cation exchange capacity? And we see here we have uh, method CS01, CS02, CS21. And now we link to the next table, please. Next slide. Oh, this is oh sorry, I forgot. I think I think I missed I missed one slide. And then you could see which which profile, which laboratory methods this actually is. So I think one was with uh, uh, ammonium acetate, uh, another method is with barium chloride. So you have these different procedures to measure CEC. Okay, this is then a summary of, uh, 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 we give some summary data. 
so how many profiles? So uh, Nigeria is in, in the blue box. So we have 1,251 profiles, and then including both uh, geographic coordinates as well as laboratory data on which we focused, it's about 1,200 profiles at that time. Next slide, please. And also with, uh, let's say, uh, the profile layer data. So laboratory data, it's approximately for the different properties different, but it was above uh, uh, 5,000 uh, uh, layers in Nigeria. But then for base saturation, 4,893, for example. So your, your average organic carbon here would be 6.2 gram per kilogram, but please do note that is including topsoils, midsoils, and subsoils. So I mean, uh, eh, should that maybe also make a query only of your topsoil, and then you could have an impression about your average organic carbon. This is just from the profiles. You could also do it from a map. Please, next slide. Okay, now um, the Africa Soil Profile Database has been a good starting point to compile national soil profile databases in collaboration with national partners. So here we have now uh, a screen of, of Nigeria with the purple of the, let's say, the legacy data in, in blue of the AFSIS-1 Sentinel sites, so there are only a few, and in yellow I added data from uh, uh, the work that, uh, that was done in collaboration with OCP uh, for Morocco, this is the mice belt. So this is not really profile data, but also topsoil data. Um, Next, next, next uh, screen, please. Hello. Next uh, slide. Yes, please. Okay. And I mean, if you would start, I would. I was searching a little bit on the internet this week, and uh, uh, this was a, a geo portal from uh, IITA uh, in Ibadan in your country, and they also have actually in red. It's, uh, it's the Africa soil profile database, so there's the red points. In, in, in green, I also the OCP uh, mice belt pointer they also just showed. But as you can see, they also had added purple. Uh, and I think that's uh, data from the yam belt and there are some other data. So they, there is some additional data sets, one or two uh, data sets uh, which, which could be new. So for example, we have this one data already and now we can already, it is already digital. So you could add this data. Uh, it's, it's easy. I mean, what is already digital is more easy than what is still analog. Um, uh, can, I, can you show the lower part of the slide, please? Yeah, okay. Uh, the problem, of course, with this IITA data set actually is there are no data, metadata. So actually the data are not explained. That's a problem. Um, but then you have to maybe contact uh, the data provider. And then how could you do this? So here actually we have uh, developed a template uh, to automate the process of, of data ingestion and standardization to uh, as, as far as possible. And can you, I, I like also to show the, the text on the lower part of this slide. Uh, yeah, so this template we developed this for the Rwanda SIS uh, uh, project, Rwanda soil profiles. And we have one table is data sets or I mean, there you define what data set is this, for example, coming from uh, yeah, from a certain survey. Then we have the original data. Yeah, that's, you can read in your original data and your original metadata. You have to define your original metadata. So you can see in this whole, whole, whole uh, table that you have source data set identifier and a profile identifier. That one you define yourself, but then you import you just import your, your original data. Just copy them there, right there, eh, on the profile on the layer level. Then uh, there is uh, uh, this table, the correlation table. That's actually where you do the manual work, where you map your original metadata to your standard metadata. So this property corresponds, original property corresponds to this standard uh, property. Uh, that's, that's the key part, but that's manual. And then once you have done this, so yeah, there you do the mapping, then you can indeed with, with, the, with the script just transform uh, the big blue arrow on the back on the lower part, your original data to your standard data. So this is quite useful. Uh, we can explain it uh, in more detail how it works. And next slide, please. 
Okay, a few examples. So this is also how we collaborated with uh, with different partners. So in Cameroon, uh, we, we, we added, uh, so partners, they added additional data. So we went from 460 profiles to 1,400 profiles. Uh, these are all legacy data. Next uh, slide, please. Same in Ghana, actually, uh, we had data from some foreign profiles, but then in collaboration with uh, with our partners, we moved to up up to two thousand profiles. Next uh, prof next slide, please. This we recently did with. Uh, with uh, uh, please what? mute uh, your microphone, please, if you're not speaking. Thank you. This is what we recently did together with the random uh, partners. So we had almost 100 so data for 100 so profiles, quite old. Uh, and we and together we, we are able to compile them using this template, original data, mapping, and then standardized data to over 5,000 uh, point locations. And oh yeah, what I want to say, so this includes both full profiles yeah, over full depth and also topsoil data yeah, of let's say a shallower depth. Uh, I should uh, emphasize that. Uh, I don't know the query in blue anymore, but uh, um, it's quite a nice density. Next pro next slide, please. Uh, yeah, okay, and this way uh, we achieved at this moment uh, uh, at this level. So we have the Africa soil profile database plus uh, data from the Cameroon soil profiles, Ghana soil profiles, Ethio uh, soil profiles, Rwanda soil profiles. And then we would like to add the Nigerian soil profiles uh, together with uh, the Nigerian soil Institute for Soil Science or the Nigerian Community of Soil Science. Um, there's also additional, let's say, topsoil data uh, from uh, AFSIS, ETOSIS, uh, OCP, uh, uh, NICE as I call it here, uh, OCP, uh, what we did ourselves, IFTC, etc. So it's just work in progress. Uh, next slide, please. I think it is. Yeah, so this, I like to, I like to, to have a break here. I need to have a uh, so we said, we, okay, we do two sections. So this is about really compiling the data. And the next session will be about more about using the data. So please, I, 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 uh, I give the word to, to Professor Tude to uh, have a, a, a short session about uh, questions and answers if people do have questions. And if I do have answers. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Juan, that's yes, great. Please. Thank you very much. Really great. All right, members of the um, soil science community in Nigeria, you've listened to this brilliant lecture giving. Um, you have any questions? You have any contribution, any input you want to make? You have just five minutes on this particular issue. Yes, shall we then? Yes, Ogunkole uh, is my name. Yes. Professor Raji, you can take over, I guess. You are dealing, Professor Raji. I'm with you. Yes, so Professor yes, I, I, I was going to just uh, appreci appreciate the present presentation and uh, uh, ask by yourself. Short question is for question and answer, it's on the uh, screen already. Right? Please, Professor Gukule is asking a question. Could we? Yes, yes. and I would, I would like to ask also. It's about the accuracy of that. Uh, one, needs to, one needs to know more on how you handle accuracy and uh, the uh, degree of reliability of the data that are combined. For instance, 
I don't know. There are, these are legacy data. How many years are combinable? If I can ask you that. How many years of data? For instance, is it five years or two years? Because we, and uh, in addition to that, the methodology used in obtaining the data, that is both particularly uh, laboratory methodology and the accuracy in the laboratory too. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we need to have more from you on how you handle this, so that uh, whatever uh, map, whatever uh, presentation you give will be reliable. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I think it's, a, it's actually a, a very important and crucial good question, and also maybe one of the least easy to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually at this very moment, we, we do have a PhD student at ISRIC uh, who is working for uh, four years on actually the, the issue of assessing the quality of the data itself. Uh, as you say, um, you have different laboratories that can use the same methods, but maybe one laboratory can do it better than another laboratory. Then we have the issue, if you use different methods, uh, they can be of high quality, but if you combine them for a certain purpose, uh, maybe it's correct, maybe they are not correct. So this uh, uh, is very important. So it's one of so uh, so she knows more about it than I do. But um, one of the issues is that if you compile a legacy, you should specify this this variability. So later, if you are an expert, you can make a career where you say, I only want data from this laboratory, or I only want data from this age, or I only want data of this method and plus maybe that and that method, but not, uh, uh, not other methods for certain properties. Do you see what I mean? Now, assessing the quality of the data itself, that is really very difficult. I mean, if you have a report, uh, uh, then for me or maybe somebody else, it's very difficult to estimate the quality of that data. If you would, let's say, write a report, I can then not really say what the accuracy is. If not, you publish it yourself. So if you say, okay, I have collected these data with this accuracy, then we can uh, 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 quantify it. Um, but most of the legacy data, they do not have, let's say, uh, reported, um, reported accuracy uh, on, on that data. They don't also report the accuracy of their of their laboratory. I mean, some laboratory laboratories they do participate in this. For example, uh, what's the name again? Uh, Laspal, Laspal, or so I don't know. Um, I, I forgot the name to be honest. Waypal, Waypal. Yeah, so it's a world. So these are different laboratories who do send their samples. No, who do get, receive samples from Waypal? They measure them, and then later they, eh, it is compared with reference uh, uh, reference laboratory. So then you can see how well or how bad are you doing, and then you can also quantify the accuracy of, your, of let's say, uh, your measurements of or your lab performance. Now, okay, and I'll move, but I did estimate. And, uh, well, mm -hmm. You did not touch. One aspect of my question, uh, for instance, I feel combining uh, data with a space uh, obtained within two years may not be as serious as combining data because these are legacy data well, with 10 year uh, gap. Yeah. Uh, how many, can, should, shouldn't we pin down that maximum of maybe two or three or four years are those that can be combined? Shouldn't yeah. we do that? Maybe it's, it's also a, it's a, a good question, and this has been a subject of discussion for also many years. Uh, I think there are two things to it. Uh, one, one of course is um, uh, the stability of the soil property. 
Yeah, so let's say certain salt properties like sent content, cation exchange capacity, or uh, and then you can argue which one to include or not. They are they are relatively stable over time. Uh, you can have erosion or something like that, but otherwise these properties they are stable. Maybe there are other salt properties like boron content or nitrogen. Uh, maybe total nitrogen is still quite stable, but it also decreases in time, um, or changes in time. But that, I mean, this is it's a it's a bit of a subjective estimation. Yeah, but I mean, certain soil properties, maybe especially from the topsoil, yeah, indicating your soil fertility and maybe your soil health and uh, change by your management, it would be worthwhile to measure them maybe more often. And other properties which you only want to use, for example, to assess uh, your rootability or, or or other soil constraints. And you do for the soil profile, and they can be quite old. They don't really change over time. Now, the second point is, of course, it would be nice to have new soil data every two years, but it's also very expensive. Okay, so sometimes it's a trade-off between uh, what what you would like and also for what is possible. So then, then you have to make an estimation and justify what you did. And I think once you produce like map using let's say legacy data, you can argue. Also to maybe your minister or, or a funder or so to say like, hey, we would like to update these maps. But look what we already did. But you can do it better, right? right? With new data. Um, well, that could be a good argument. But it's an important point indeed. Thank you. Lastly, sir, can, do you think if we use, for instance, uh, or maybe uh, let me ask first, do we have any uh, regression equations relating, for instance, Brepi to Melich and all these things, so that and that cuts across countries, so that we can easily predict one from another. Yeah, this is also this is what we call the harmonization. Indeed, uh, it's also a very good point. Uh, it's a, also a, a very difficult one. Um, and we do have some equations, right? But not all, and also uh, maybe not. Yeah, maybe some some are developed in in the, in the United States. Can we apply them in Nigeria, or so maybe are from Ethiopia? Can we apply them, etc., uh, etc.? Et but the problem with, but we do have certain equations. We do have them, but it's not for all uh, properties and let's say all combinations. Um, also, because the problem is. To develop these, um, yeah, transfer functions, huh? these translations, actually you would need double analysis, right? You take one sample and you have to analyze it by both Melich as well as Bray, yes. or both Melich yes. also, or, or also then Bray, and then trying to make these relationships. I've been trying quite a lot from the database, but yes. most of most of the data. Actually, this, this is, these are not available. There are only uh, both surveys. They only do one map, one uh, one property with one method, and not two methods. So these data are quite rare. Um, okay. I was recently at a European uh, program, and then we were also discussing this. And then I think there were some uh, plans, indeed, from uh, European soil uh, well, yeah, group. To, to indeed start collecting double, uh, doing double analysis. And in a way, it's very comparable also to this, let's say, spectral measurements, right? So you, you measure something spectrally, which is nothing, but then you try to, the library try to translate it to a soil property. And then you can translate it to also, or you can translate it to mailing. And also we had a PhD student uh, who just published uh, one or two weeks ago about trans Trends about um, converting data from Melich tree to also, and also from Melich tree potassium to uh, potassium by ammonium acetate. And these yes. are the input to Quest, for example. So we are working on it, and we would we would love to to elaborate this because this is a very important issue. Because indeed, uh, if you have a lot of data, sometimes you have to make a query and you have to put some of the data aside that you say, I will not use these data because they are too different, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, and with, other pro with other properties, it's you can combine them. So for each property, you have to uh, 
uh, defines the method that you can say, okay, I put them together, justified, and maybe for other applications, you do not put them together, but it's not, do you see what I mean? Thank you very much. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, please, can I make this observation? Hello. Yes, hello. Yes, we yes. can hear during the, uh, Yes, during the source survey of Nigeria at re uh, recognized level carried out by FDLR, all the samples were taken to one laboratory at Ibada, IAR and T, uh, and the, 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 the data the data were reliable, quite right. But, uh, uh, subsequently, or even before then, um, you see that the samples were analyzed in different laboratories. And uh, definitely, definitely, there are going to be... Uh, 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 we, are, we are supposed to do. Now, in order to take care of this, Nice, nice has um, uh, uh, um, identified six laboratories in the six geopolitical zones where our samples can be taken so that uh, the results uh, 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 could be relatively um, um, uh, uniform. So um, I think the, I want to advise that uh, our samples should be taken to these laboratories. Instead of uh, doing it in our different local laboratories where the, 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 the laboratory situation is, is not conducive enough to carry out very good um, um, analysis. So this is uh, what I want to contribute to. And I encourage uh, NIS to uh, keep on uh, equipping laboratories and then um, supervising the, the operations. Thank you very much. That's yeah, thank, you for, thank you for your observation. Hello? Yeah, it's an important Hello? point. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, please. On, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me to make some comments. Mm. Actually, when we are talking about uh, you know standardization of laboratories, we may not have to just uh, leave our our uh, our our samples with only the six laboratories. What uh, I attended the 2019 uh, Netherlands uh, Soil Conference and Vagnivan Soil Conference actually. And during one of the side events, the soil physics group, I found that what they are doing is that they have a, a, a panel, a panel that accredits laboratories. They, what they go, what they do is that that panel we go around yeah. and, uh, and look at the facilities and then accredit those laboratories, harmonize the way they, they harmonize their, the, the, the methods that they use yeah. in uh, analyzing samples so that, you know, we can have a very good spread across the country. If we're able to have, you know, NIST is able to move around, harmonize those things and then get laboratories with specialist, uh, you know, you know, equipment who can, you know, have the specialization of analyzing probably soil physical properties or, you know, both. So I think that yeah. it would be a good idea if we can, if we can start that. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that, I think that is indeed way, Paul. And, uh, and if, if indeed laboratories there, they can, they, they can control their, let's say the quality of their lab. And I, I think also in Nigeria, if indeed you would work with one lab from IAR and T, or maybe six regional labs, and that you actually have uh, uh, an exchange between at least those six labs, and possibly also with WEPAL, uh, to, uh, to 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 monitor your your quality of your of your of your laboratories and, and your data. So I think it's a very important point. Okay. So what do we do? Next questions, or we go to the next uh, session? Is the rest? So the next session is not so long. Eh? It's, it's, it's it's short. Uh, Prof. Prof. Chude or Prof. Sure. I don't think we can. Yes. What's very rare? 
I think it's yeah. good if you allow him to conclude so that we can okay. then ask another set of questions. Okay, you have your answer, I think. All right. Okay. Then, then let's you. do the next, uh, next part. Thank you very much for the questions. Actually, uh, I, I like them very much. And I mean, we could talk and discuss for days <laughs> uh, on this, uh, but it's very interesting. So uh, let's hope we get another opportunity for that maybe one day. Okay, let me continue. Um, and we talk now about um, the use of the SOAP profile data that you compiled, let's say the Nigerian SOAP profile database, for example. Yeah, and uh, the use for agricultural it's development. Uh, and I take as an example, mm. uh, agricultural development is can go in many ways, yeah. but I give take it as an example um, to do, let's say, spatial nutrient gap analysis uh, to model and map fertilizer recommendations. So we like to, to produce maps of fertilizer recommendations. Uh, uh, could we please mute the microphones because of interference so we can round up quickly? Please mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here I give uh, my uh, my let's say uh, explanation. We talk about this the nutrient gap, and that's really the gap, or let's say the deficiency between the crop demand for nutrients and the soil supply of nutrients. So we have our soil fertility, uh, which supplies nutrients, but we also have a crop which demands for nutrients, and the crop demand for nutrients, uh, this gap, uh, that's a deficiency. Uh, also uh, defines the response to fertilizer nutrients. Now, what is important, I think that the demand for nutrients is very much uh, uh, determined by the water limited yield. So in one, one area, if there is no water, the soil cannot grow, okay? So it's the water availability that defines the capacity to transpire and to grow. And with a certain amount of water, the crop would demand for nutrients. If it doesn't have the nutrients, it cannot grow as much as the water is available. So this crop demand for nutrients, uh, the, let's say the potential yield or water limited potential, the target yield maybe, is very much defined by uh, water availability, climate, but also soil water availability. And that's really very much defined by your profile data. I mean, you want to know how deep is your soil? Is it sand or clay? How deep can your roots go? Uh, uh, is, is very stony, yeah? are they constrained? So that really defines the potential of your, of your crop and also the demand for nutrients. And now we talk about, let's say, the supply of nutrients from the soil, which is, of course, yeah, uh, mainly uh, determined by topsoil data. Yeah? Your soil fertility is indeed mainly in the topsoil. But if you only look at topsoil data, only at soil fertility, Actually, it's very difficult to make a good recommendation, or you have to uh, develop do many trials in every agroecological zone to develop these uh, responses, but you can also calculate it and, of course, validate it with your, with your trial data. But this is an important, uh, important difference. So I think that real soil profile data are important to estimate your soil water availability and there with your crop nutrient demand. And topsoil data may be good enough to, uh, to uh, assess and map uh, your soil nutrient availability. So these are, uh, that's, in, that's quite important. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? So I mean, one very quickly, uh, let's go very, through it very quickly. Let's let's approach. Uh, so we have soil collections that we already uh, 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 discussed. Uh, you go to the field, you do a survey, or you have a library, et cetera, for where you get your data. You put them in your soil profile data set, combine them with some uh, covariates to produce maps and to produce soil information. This we do, we do this, yeah, we did this at, let's say, continental level, uh, but with additional data from a specific area of interest, yeah, we can then, up, and you select additional data, you can update your map that area and make it more precise, more accurate. Please, next slide. 
But once you have your maps, I mean, that's very nice, but you like to use your maps. And for example, to, to map, to map uh, the response to fertilizers, and trying to predict what the response to fertilizers will be. You can use different kinds of uh, models, and we have crop growth simulation models or machine learning. I mean, uh, it depends on your data. But there you try to use your soil information. Uh, you produce your response maps here, you calculate your fertilizer recommendations, and then a farmer or somebody could decide to invest, yes or no, uh, in a fertilizer. If again, you go to a specific zone, for example, the zone for yam or for uh, cocoa or for maize or for millet, I don't know, uh, or maybe vegetables. Now, uh, you, you could collect additional data from that area to rerun this whole thing again, to produce more accurate maps and produce more accurate predictions of your and more accurate uh, recommendations. And sometimes you cannot do that for the whole of the country. You do that only for a specific area. But you do have already an ID on forehand. And if you start course, it's also useful for the industry and the ministry, etc., the government. Next slide, please. So in one way we go top down. That's what we call generic. Oops, bad quality. And the other way we have. Uh, specific that would be area specific which is then a more let's say bottom up and you try to combine these two next slide please now this this picture is indeed okay now we're going to use the soil data this picture is shown also by my colleague uh, Gerard Hevelink uh, a few months ago about pedometrics about digital soil mapping so uh, you have your soil profile data you combine them you have your your modeling and at the end you have a, a soil map soil property map so this is also what we did in the, in the next slide, please. So this is an example of, um, uh, of, of soil mapping. So this is then, we did this for all of the continent, Africa, but actually this was something that we did uh, in West Africa. And here we, we have a map of the soil phosphorus uh, measured by Melich tree. And this one is really for the topsoil, uh, 30 centimeters depth. And uh, which is, of course, uh, this is soil nutrient content. Uh, but the, from here, we calculate the soil nutrient supply, like how much is indeed available for uptake by the crop. Um, this, this is quite coarse, uh, this is continental scale. But okay. And next slide, please. And this could be an example of the other side of the equation. So this would be the, uh, the plant available water in the soil rootable depth. So we did assess estimate the rootability of the soil, looking at constraints at different depths. And then also, I mean, about the amount of uh, the, 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 the available water holding capacity within that rootable depth. And you can see that also varies quite a lot um, um, over, over uh, in different areas. And I think, I mean, if your, let's say, rootable depth is shallow and your amount of water available is shallow, then also your potential for your yield will be lower and also your fertilizer recommendation will be lower and of course that you have your fluctuation in time etc but this depth is, is, is really quite an important factor in this please next slide okay here we can go very quickly these are just the results so we can go uh, so here we give a few examples so we go straight to the output fertilizer recommendation for millet sorghum and please go on mice so you can see them changing next slide See them changing, uh, they're going down a little bit. Then we go for phosphorus. Just, just click now uh, uh, six times or so. <laughs> but next slides, please. Again, again, next slide. Millet, sorghum. Next slide. Mice. Next slide. Calcium. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, thank you. So I like to see the text under under this uh, map. So here you can see already that the the fertilizer recommendations that we calculated at this scale uh, is uh, that the variation in the fertilizer nutrient recommendation seems to be more determined by the water limited crop nutrient demand than by the soil nutrient supply. Right? Everybody focuses on measuring taking soil samples from the topsoil for soil fertility. But this soil water is as important, if not, huh? actually, you need both. 
for a consistent analysis. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, we did something similar in, in, in Ghana. We were asked by, by the ISDA, so we, 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 had, we used our, 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 our data from Ghana that we, together with the, with, with the partners there, there are more data eh, from, that I see there in the top of the IBC. Actually, these data are a little bit unreliable, maybe. And then also we looked at the soil routable depth, eh, that same map, because indeed this country, and I, maybe Nigeria is almost comparable. Huh? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you have the leptosols, plintosols, glacials, alisols. I mean, they are all, have, let's say, shallow rootable depths. So, now we go to the next slide, please. These are just examples, yeah, please. So, indeed, we calculated the, the soil supply for phosphorus on the left hand side. We also calculated the crop demand for phosphorus yeah, on the right hand side. And you can see already, you see the pattern of the rootable depth coming back. And this crop phosphorus demand eh, is, let's, let's say, has the same scale as the target yield. Next slide. So there we see the gap, eh, the deficiency of phosphorus, and then the for fertilizer phosphorus recommendation. And you can see that the pattern of the recommendation actually uh, reflects to a large extent the rootable depth. Not fully, because you can see in the far south, it's very acid, so there's a high phosphorus fixation. And so there, of course, uh, uh, you would uh, you would need a lot of phosphorus to reach a certain target yield. But you do see the, the rootable depth reflected in the recommendation. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Now, yeah, based on this, uh, we would also work maybe with OCP, but this is now paused yeah, to do to start in Ghana uh, doing similar work. We would then do take soil samples. Uh, on, on these locations, but not only of the top soil, but indeed also of uh, uh, also going down. So we would like to know the rootable depth, to know both soil fertility and uh, soil water availability for the crop. Next slide. And here we did this. Let's go through this very quickly. This is the last uh, session. This this is what we did current work with with OCP, but this is on irrigated rice. So the, I mean, let's say water availability is. Uh, sufficient, we assume it is sufficient, so we, we focus more on the soil fertility here indeed. So we took soil samples, please next slide, this is the Office de Niger. Uh, these are the, uh, we analyzed the data, so this would be the, the, the results. I think red was Senegal and, and blue was Mali. Yeah. Next slide please. Then okay, this is then a map, right? so we calculate the soil, for example here, soil nitrogen content in kilogram per hectare, so that would be about 3,000 kilogram per hectare. Next slide, please. And the same map, I mean, we calculate the supply, that it would be only 85 kilogram nitrogen per hectare. So we have a content of 3,000, but actually 85 is actually available, supplied uh, from the soil to the crop uh, that can take up. Next slide, please. Okay, so here indeed we, we, we compared uh, the results, our, uh, our recommendations for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium on the top. Green is high, red is low. And actually the, on the bottom, uh, you can see that the same area with the arrow, uh, we, we already made an estimation at coarse resolution, what I showed in the beginning. And you can see that actually the, the, the patterns are quite comparable. But we have collected additional data now, and now we can make a more accurate uh, recommendation. Okay, thank you. Next uh, slide. Okay, very quickly. So, I mean, we did this for all micronutrients. So, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, copper, zinc, and boron. So, we made uh, uh, fertilizer recommendations uh, for all these uh, different properties. Next slide, please. And then we tested them with validation trials and actually. Uh, have, they, they produced new, new, three new fertilizers uh, in Mali, and these were the results from the validation trials. And actually, the additional response like was about one ton uh, per hectare. Uh, additional, eh? so you have a response to the default fertilizer, and then the new fertilizer was another one ton uh, more response. So the additional response was like uh, 60 or 120 percent higher than the response to the default blanket recommendation. Okay, thank you. That's, this is just uh, what I just like to see. So uh, next slide is the conclusion. Okay, 
So, I mean, this, what I conclude here is that the Nigeria sort profile database can be compiled at, rel at lo relatively low costs from legacy data, which do typically represent full profile depths. Uh, this profile database uh, can be enriched at higher costs with new additional data uh, that you collect from the field at the lab, uh, which do typically, but not necessarily, represent top cells. You can also decide to sample deeper than only top cells. Um, now, the Nigeria soil profile database then can serve to map soil properties, right? Um, and this soil property maps uh, for Nigeria can serve to map, uh, to interpret and map the soil quality and the soil constraints for agricultural productivity. Uh, so what is really a quality or what's really a constraint? Can you solve, manage that constraint or not, etc. So that the Nigerian soil quality maps can serve decision making uh, in agricultural management and there with agricultural development. Okay, I think that uh, the Nigerian Institute for Soil Science and uh, the Soil Science Society of Nigeria and, and maybe also ISRIC, uh, and also ISRIC actually, uh, can combine strengths, for example, in the community of practice or, or another way, and uh, to compile the Nigerian soil profile database for agricultural development. And that's a possibility. Okay, please, next is the last slide. So uh, this community of practice is actually a, a new development also at ISRIC. So we, we like to, to, uh, uh, to build a community together yeah, with, uh, uh, with soil pra practitioners like you. Uh, and please, um, so we, we develop a when we deal with different subjects. And uh, here in the blue circles are actually data organizations. So that's really compiling a soil profile database. Uh, Etc. But also, I mean, uh, information application that would be the next, the second subject about maybe for fertilizer recommendations to which we can uh, maybe provide support. But please, if you want to know more about this community of practice, uh, see here this uh, uh, internet address, isregard.org, utilize slash community practice. And there you can uh, learn more and also sign up for this uh, community, which is actually available for everybody. Okay, thank you very much. This is the uh, next slide. This is um, the last slide. And um, maybe we have more questions, maybe answers also, and maybe a, a discussion. Thank you very much for, at for your attention. I'll give now the word back to Professor Tudor. It's been great. What's that better if it will not drive? You know, as come as come, um, Professor Raji, is Professor Raji there? Yes, sir. I'm there. Uh, Professor Raji, uh, if you if you think you enjoyed it, yes. if you think we should appreciate um, Joanne and uh, all the architects. Please, please say something. Say something, and do something. Uh, I, I was, I think uh, maybe the conversation will continue afterwards, uh, because I know a lot of us enjoy this uh, presentation, and uh, that is quite shown in the number still remaining on this platform after over two and a half hours. <laughs> After over two and a half hours, we are over 100 of us still on this platform. That goes to show that most of us are actually very eager, not only to listen, but also to collaborate, like uh, Johan has mentioned, as a community of soil scientists with ISRIC on this very important Nigeria soil information system. On behalf of all of us here, uh, we appreciate what has gone in to making this lecture very, very, very useful to us. Uh, if Professor Chude wants me to give a vote of thanks, I thought we were going to take some questions. Then I can go ahead and do that. I think Johan would oh. like a question, so what? I, w I thought you would like to take some more questions. We really enjoy this, and uh, there are one or two hands. 
I could see Professor yeah. Aziz. We, 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 can accommodate, we, can we can accommodate one or two hands. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think we can. Because people have waited and, uh, for this lecture for a long, long time. But like you say, we're not shut, we're not shutting down after after today. Yeah. We'll continue the discussion the will continue. Yeah. Yes. 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 The committee of But I think we can give uh, some Donald Duke. Donald Madwiko is there, Aziz is there. Maybe three of them can go ahead and ask these questions. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank yes. you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I don't have a question. I actually have um, a comment or addition uh, from the last session on harmonization. I actually appreciate the uh, presenter and the conclusion in this last presentation. It actually, um, the conclusions spoke my mind. I am thinking with the rates um, organizations are uh, Complied to precision agriculture, uh, soil uh, data collection and analysis. I think it is time that um, beyond harmonizing laboratories, we should also harmonize uh, protocols for collecting this data samples across the country and other regions so that uh, beyond the laboratory results, the method of col uh, sample collections will be uniform and that will make for easy um, merging of data across our regions. That is my same contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Nis has uh, taken notes. Has taken taking notes. Yes. Uh, because the committee of um, uh, the community of science, certainly, it makes sense. Otherwise, comparison of results becomes a difficult, becomes difficult, and that would ultimately affect recommendations and create confusion for farmers. We will we, 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 we visit it. Yes, Raju, can continue. Can I ask my question? Please. Can I? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, my question. Yes, please. Yeah, my question is for Joanne, and uh, it's uh, about the legacy data that have been used to develop uh, uh, the soil data that he has discussed. And uh, I want to know to what extent, for practical purposes, to what extent can we actually extrapolate the use of some of this data that you have? If I wish to plan maybe uh, uh, my agricultural practice at my local scale. Do, 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 do you think the data they have gathered for a thousand plus profile or a thousand plus uh, uh, surface soil data could be enough to actually uh, plan my uh, agriculture at my local scale? Then secondly, to what extent can uh, uh, we domesticate some of this data that you have for us? in Nigeria for practical purposes, for use for ag our agricultural development? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this question. Uh, you really have good questions, so. Huh? <laughs> the critical subjects. I, re I remember when uh, when I started with AFSIS, uh, then at a certain moment, there were different partner countries, right? And uh, at that time we had this Professor Emmanuel from Zaria, you, you should know him, I think. Amapo was there and he was always emphasizing, for me, it's not about the soil, it's really about the crop, right? And he said, OK, I want, to, so he wants to, let's say, develop the soil information for at the end, a purpose. And the purpose is really food security, crop production, and individual uh, and also others, farmers making a decision. So uh, this is a little bit what you, what you, what you, are referring to and this is a, of course an enormous challenge i mean these days there are let's say many many initiatives from different uh, players developing apps and developing protocols to maybe give an advice to a farmer or maybe the farmer himself or herself can uh, can maybe use an app or something like that too to give an advice now 
that device that would be based on, let's say, certain uh, prior information like a so map, and that should be indeed accurate. If not, I mean, it's, it's I mean, I, I would, I would, it would be terrible if, let's say, the information that we produce would cause individual farmers uh, to have to, to grow even less or getting into even, let's say, bigger problems than they maybe already are. So that is really something we should avoid. So it's a very, it's an important question. And I think that, I mean, there are two different ways. Um, one, but that would require an enormous extension uh, apparatus eh, to, I mean, trying to reach all these individual farmers with, with good advice, I don't know, eh, based on maybe local observations, which are maybe very accurate, and maybe, eh, and, and then also making a good interpretation and a good advice. And, but that, that is also, I mean, proves already since many decades, not always that easy to achieve that, let's say, that level of uh, extension and that level of uh, yeah, accuracy. And, um, and the other way could be that so maps, but again, you're right. I mean, we have the resolution, we have the accuracy and also the accuracy of your interpretation, which is actually the most important, most difficult part. Uh, what we are doing right now is trying to bridge this uh, challenge. Of course, now with, we, we have been asked also by, um, uh, by, uh, by Americans actually, to look at this Lens PKS, App. I don't know if you know it, but that is um, uh, a mobile app which actually collects local field data. You could also add maybe additional data, uh, lab data. And you try to combine this information with information from maps. So that means at a certain location, you can have information from maps and having a recommendation, which is coarse, maybe not very accurate, but then taking the right variables to observe in the field can then help you to tune these prior recommendations uh, to, let's say, to, to, to fine tune these recommendations. Uh, if we estimate, oh, it can be, let's say, a sandy soil in this grid cell, and this is the recommendation, and then you go there, but actually it proves to be not sandy, but more loamy, uh, you, you may tune to a higher water availability and maybe a higher recommendation. But it's all very difficult to do at scale. The good thing about the map is that you can do it at scale. Uh, right. You can extrapolate that you can go everywhere and to be very accurate at the, at the location is very limit local skills so you have to find have to find the balance between the two and try to find maybe the, the funds also i mean to to go to this let's say very high level of precision and accuracy which is sometimes very difficult to achieve at scale um yeah um then again i would say if indeed you would maybe, let's say, start doing a soft fertility mapping or so, and you would go to a certain region. Of course, you can produce much more accurate maps with more additional data, right? And new data, you can produce a more accurate map. And then you can still also look at maybe the stable soil properties like soil depth, et cetera, to see like, what's the potential of the of the, the crop? How much nutrients do it demand? What is it really the soil supply? And then what's the gap? So what is really the, uh, the amount of fertilizer that I would uh, recommend? Yeah, it's 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 a it's not an easy question to fully answer. Actually, I think it's a challenge for all of us together. Thank you. No, that's good enough. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. There are two questions on the chat. I don't know if you are having access to them. The, yeah. the two questions are from Professor Abdul Kaduri. The first question is that she's thanking you for the presentation, but her question is on the temporal validity of the models and maps considering the highly dynamic nature of certain soil properties, especially with different management. Then the second part of her question is that what is the name of the mobile app just discussed? Okay. This Two questions. All right, yeah, so, I see the question. Yeah. My name is Johan, and Rick is my colleague or my director. So we do it a bit together. Yeah. Um, so the name of the mobile app is Land PKS. So that means actually Land, Land Potential Knowledge System. It's actually an American uh, app. Uh, so that app is still, uh, yeah, it's, it's more focused towards data collection. And now we they have asked us to maybe bring that to a next version, uh, 
Uh, and then, I mean, I would propose to indeed uh, bring in these interpretations indeed uh, to, to, to bring in local observations to, to make, to interpret your, your, your map information better uh, to make it more, let's say, really site specific. Um, but we still have to do that. Now I know plenty of other apps around uh, also in Africa. Um, and the first one, now I think we discussed this already a little bit about this, uh, the temporal validity of the models and the maps, or maybe the data. Uh, um, so let's say first the data and then maybe the maps coming out of them and the models based on those data to map and also then the models to interpret your, let's say, crop performance for, and, and recommendations uh, with a highly dynamic nature of certain soil properties. Yes, and different management. I think this is the whole point. Um, uh, First of all, I think that certain soil properties are not very dynamic, okay? I mean, we have soil properties which are not dynamic. And then we have other properties which are moderately dynamic. And we have soil properties which are highly dynamic. Uh, okay, let's say total nitrogen is does change over time uh, with, with management. If you give more, uh, maybe organo mineral fertilizers, you could and, and residue management, you could maybe increase your total uh, uh, nitrogen, for example, but your nitrate in solution is, of course, highly dynamic, right? I mean, that changes by the hour or by so. Uh, uh, so, but it's true. I mean, so, so the soil properties they do change, and this is one of the problems that most of the soil properties uh, do change for the worse. Uh, I mean, this is uh, what we call uh, uh, nutrient mining and, and land soil degradation at the end. And also, I mean, we talk now about soil health, so we try to manage the soil such. That it can also improve, right? And so these soil properties. Um, so I mean, I think we should distinguish between one stable soil properties, relatively stable, and relatively dynamic soil properties. And I think that the topsoil indeed is the most vulnerable part of the soil that changes under management, and which is also more related to soil fertility and and soil health, and then. Uh, that would justify to put more emphasis on on the sampling of the topsoil uh, to to see uh, to take the temporal variation into consideration. But I would still always combine it with also soil information mm -hmm. from uh, yeah, at least till a meter. Yeah. So that defines really the rootability of your crop. Uh, if you have your if you have your iron pan at six. Centimeter, then, then that's really where the crop stops, and really gives a very different response to fertilizer than if your if your roots could go 100 centimeter. So I would still combine those two type of information. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, this won't be a bad place to drop this uh, cutting for today. Uh, we just four minutes yes, to yes. two, three hours. Three hours. Yeah. We've been here for the last three hours. And uh, we still have over 110 participants. I think, uh, please, let's give ourselves a round of applause. You can do it electronically. I think it's better for us to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Professor, today the registrar, can we go to the next item, vote of thanks, or you have any announcement? If you already have no, no more to there's no announcement for now. Uh, okay, the announcement okay. for Thank now uh, we'll make available the record of this lecture, including the slide. Yes, yes. There's a very high demand. So go ahead and, um, apart from just clapping hands, um, add more words to it uh, and, and, and give it life. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much, Mr. Registrar. Uh, I think uh, on behalf of the soil science community, especially on behalf of the president of NIS, Professor Ayo Gunkule, who is also the chairman of the Governing Council of NIS, the vice president, Professor Unwaka who is have been here with us this morning, and all members of councils of NIS who find time to participate in this 
very, very informative lecture. On behalf of all of us, we want to thank the history team. We want to thank them, starting with the director of history, Rick van der Bosch, who has been with us also. Despite all the hitches we had in the morning, we've had a very great lecture. So we want to thank him and extend our appreciation to history as an organization for finding needs and Nigeria soil scientist community worthy of having an MOU with us and for placing at our disposal all your facilities anytime we need it. This is the second time you are giving us this training. The first one was on pedometrics. This one is also on having soil, uh, Nigeria soil information system. We appreciate all your resources, all your energy, we are placed at our disposal. We also want to appreciate Andres Bosman, the manager of external relationship at ISTRIC, and the lecturer of today, Johan Linas, for giving us a very brilliant presentation. We know the lecture is not ending. Today. We're expecting to have a copy of this so that we can share with all our members. And definitely, we will continue to interact behind the scene. We also want to thank Emily Tona, the communication manager at ISHRI. And lastly, but not the least, we want to thank Mary Severic Musugu, our own, who is the coordinator of this project. Let me also thank all the soil scientists registered who find time to stay throughout this lecture. And I'm hoping, I pray that we'll find a way of putting what we have gained today into useful purposes for the development of soil information system in Nigeria. Thank you, and God bless history, God bless NIS, God bless Nigeria. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.